Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk from the Temple Institute, Jerusalem, Israel. Together with Yitzhak Ruvain, and today, the 24th day of the month of Elul, the 4th of September. 24th day of the month of Elul, that's 5778. 4th of September 2018, and this week, Parashat Nitzavim, you're all standing before Hashem your God. This is the last temple talk of the year 5778, and we are about to enter into the awesome days of awe. In fact, tonight, the 25th day of the month of Elul, is a very important date on the Hebrew calendar. It is the anniversary of the beginning of creation. First day of creation was the 25th day of the month of Elul. And, for example, here in the land of Israel, there are many learned and pious people that enact all sorts of special um, I would say, uh, how do I describe tikkunim Yitzchak? Special kind of special kind of um, prayer of a prayer um, introspection um, in order to m- s- uh, to mark this day, the, the first day of creation, as uh, as an elevation of mankind, and of course, the culmination of creation is man. Man is the center of creation. Creation was was brought into existence in order for man to know that there's a God in the world, and that is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of Adam HaRishon, the first man. But in the prayer service of Rosh Hashanah, we have an expression, Hayom Harat Olam, today is the birthday of the world, and it's really the birthday of Adam HaRishon. And uh, these are highly, highly charged days, highly charged indeed as we have been uh, so motivated throughout this month of Elul to um, feel the quick pace of the hourglass of the sands of our lives running through to try to grab hold of ourselves and say wait a minute where in the world are we where are we going what are we doing with our time and Rosh Hashanah is all about what are we doing with the very breath, the very life force that Hashem gave us. That's why we blow the shofar and we return that breath in its pure and pristine state. And as we've been discussing here on Temple Talk, we've been beginning every Temple Talk of the month of Elul with the blast of the shofar, which we actually sound in the synagogues um, throughout the month of Elul, except on the day before Rosh Hashanah to, to differentiate between the blasts of Rosh Hashanah, which are actually the Torah-based obligatory blasts of the service of the day. Why do we blow the shofar? First of all, the shofar is the divine service of Rosh Hashanah, as we've mentioned, because it is reminiscent of the unsullied uh, breath that we are returning in full circle to Hashem without being embellished by any false excuses or any any kind of um, empty words. We just return to him from the deepest place the very breath that he gave us that day because that's the day that he's checking out what did we do with that breath what's what what how how Hashem observes our birthday is by checking out where we're at in this world and there's actually a, a, a whole idea of other reasons why we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah there's actually 10 reasons that are cited by the famed Rabbi Sad Yagon, that are the reasons why we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. And they are, number one, because when a king is coronated, a king comes to, comes to town, uh, his entrance is, is um, accompanied by blasts of the horn. And, the sh- and the f- first and foremost, the main aspect of the divine service of Rosh Hashanah is the coronation of Hashem. And that's why the emphasis in our prayers on Rosh Hashanah is that he is the melech, he is the king. And maybe we have fallen short of our, of our duty as, as, as his subjects all throughout the year. And, and the main idea of Rosh Hashanah really is that we are accepting his sovereignty upon ourselves. Again, we're renewing it with, with uh, renewed um, vigor and commitment. It's basically a coronation of Hashem. And of course, as we've discussed also, that means we have to put something behind our words so that, there, so that it's not just a, a, um, a phrase. What it means to make him king is to make him king over us, is that 
that will make a big difference in our behavior. And that's why we emphasize the fact that the great sages taught us that melech, the word king, mem, lam, et chaf, stands for moach, lev, kaved, it's three letters, rashet tevot, the acronym of the three main um, aspects of human physiognomy, is that a word? That is representative of, Hashem, of Hashem's presence in our lives, the, the brain, the heart, and the liver. And when he's really king, when, we're, when we don't just say it, but we really mean it, then that will have a direct reflection in our emotions, in our intellect, in our response, the way we act. So that, that's reason number one, because we're coronating Hashem over our lives. Number two is that it is basically a, an alarm clock. It is a wake-up call. It is a, a tremendous um, wake up of that we should be aroused from the from the slumber that we've been somnambulating through our year number three it is a reminder of the blasts of the shofar that were heard when the torah was given at mount sinai because after all as we emphasized in our torah portion video last week our entire connection is through the Torah, through our acceptance of Torah, which is Hashem's manifestation in this world, his, his will to do the mitzvot. So number three reminds us of the Torah that was given at Mount Sinai. Number four is that the voice of the prophets throughout the Bible is, is um, compared to the blast of the shofar, and it reminds us to take heed of the voice of the prophets. Number five is that it reminds us of tears. It's a bit reminiscent of uh, crying, and it um, also jars us into um, a state of um, being very, very wide awake and motivated and open, spiritually open to the potential of our own, of our own change. Number six, it reminds us of the binding of Isaac, because the binding of Isaac was uh, repla Isaac was replaced when Hashem told Abraham that it was only a test. This has only been a test. <laughs> it was replaced with a ram that was, was caught in the thickets by its horn. And of course, when we say, remind us of the binding of Isaac, what does that mean? Why do we have to be reminded of the binding of Isaac? And the, and the idea that the sages are conveying is that the binding of Isaac was a tremendous merit for Abraham, Avinu, for Abraham, the patriarch. And there's something that he passed down to all of us in a legacy spiritual DNA, a certain kind of readiness, a certain kind of preparedness um, for self-sacrifice and, and for listening to Hashem even when it uh, countermands our reasoning. Uh, and that's what the, the secret of the binding of Isaac is all about. Um, that's number six. Number seven is that the sound of the shofar is understood to fill us with a certain, certain kind of awe, a feeling of, of, um, of trepidation. And that's a necessary component of the mindset and the tool kit that we need in order to successfully navigate through the experience of Rosh Hashanah. Um, number eight, as our sages teach us, is that it reminds us uh, to examine our own deeds. It is very, very, um, uh, very much given over to the facilitation of introspection the sound itself has a very profound effect on us. Number nine is actually kind of a flash, flash forward celebratory of the uh, redemption of the, of the fact that our sages and our prophets actually uh, tell us that a great shofar will be sounded at the time of the messianic redemption. And number ten is that it is a a hallmark of universal unity because one of the most important aspects of Rosh Hashanah and one of the and one of the most beautiful and most important to understand is that Rosh Hashanah because it's the birthday of Adam you know it's not really a Jewish thing honest honestly it is something that should be observed by the by all of humanity and in fact the most beautiful aspect of the prayers of Rosh Hashanah in the holiday prayer book called the Machzor is that they're all about the whole world coming and giving a crown on Hashem's head as it were. He doesn't have a head, don't worry. 
but, give, but, but coming forward together and crowning him and recognizing him and banding together and laying down their weapons, laying down their differences, those that are the furthest away coming from the far reaches of the world and just saying, wow, Hashem is God. And, and it's just, um, and the prayer service itself is just so amazing. And the, um, the shofar is universal. It doesn't need a translation. You right, don't need exactly. Google Translate. Another, another you don't need to download idea. anything. You don't need an app. You just need to hear the shofar. Another beautiful idea of, of, of it being so so beyond words. You know, like we said last week, that the, the whole idea about the about communication is that communication can always lead to misunderstanding and and why do you have the next expression breakdown in communication? Mm -hmm. The problem is that words can always be misunderstood. You say this is what you meant, but that's not really what I think you meant, or here's so and so to explain what it is that I really said. But here the shofar is just coming from the deepest place in the heart that is so pure um, but you know what like you mentioned an app you know when Mashiach comes are we going to need an app uh, you know now there's an app to tell you where there's the nearest minion uh, there's an app to tell you in whatever country you are if the food is kosher there's an app also on Google Play I know I mean I have an, I have an Android personally there's an app to tell you about public bathrooms in, in your area you're not going to need an app to tell you when the redemption comes. And like someone said a long time ago, you don't need a weatherman to tell which way the wind blows. You don't need no app. And I think that, that that's also the sound of the shofar. It resonates in a, on a very, very universal plane. There's an 11th reason. These, are, these 10 reasons are those that are given by the Rabbi Sadia Goon. But there's another, another reason which is taught by the Holy Baal Shem Tov, which is that, and honestly, this is the most basic thing of all, it's a scream. Mm. It's a primordial scream. That's what you feel like doing sometimes, because we live in a world gone mad. We live in strange times. There's a lot of bizarre stuff going on all around us. Did you notice? People, in my opinion, <laughs> are behaving very bizarrely. It's like whatever happened to the to the old days of people respecting each other and 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 public discourse having a little bit more. A little decorum, bit decorum, and and I don't know. It's scary out there. It's scary out there. And Rosh Hashanah is like a plea, a plea for sanity, a plea for the return of the family of man into one cohesive unit of of um, love and fraternity. That's really what Rosh Hashanah is all about. So don't tweet Tua. Whoa. And having said all that, and having gone over these reasons once, once again, and having reminded ourselves why we're blowing the shofar, let's do it one final time for the month of Elul, and get, re get ourselves ready for the real shofar blasts of Rosh Hashanah. Hope this comes out good. I have a vestibular issue. visit to the chiropractor uh, for you maybe <laughs> I think I need one now one <laughs> of the most beautiful aspects of the shofar is the simplicity of the commandment the blessing that the one who blows the shofar makes over the shofar b for the congregation is Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Olam Mashiach Kedjom Bebetzot HaVitzvah Blessed are you Hashem God eternal King who has sanctified us with, a command, with, our, with his commandments and commanded us Lishmoa ko shofar to hear the sound of the shofar. So here we just went through this whole catalog of ten different reasons that that are, are why we're blowing the shofar. What's it all about, and all sorts of things. And you know what? Whatever we said here in the name of Rabbi Sadiq, in the name of the Bashan Tov, it doesn't even scratch the surface of the deep secrets of the shofar. And and you know we we try to be as simple as we can because we're very simple people ourselves. It's kind of extremely simple. And we try to keep things on a, on a basic level, but you should just know, don't, I don't want to misrepresent, there are thousands and thousands of, of pages of endless, incredible, deepest secrets in the world of what's going on in the supernal universe, what's happening on the celestial heights, 
the reaction of the angels, um, the, 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 the spiritual mechanism of, what, of how the sound of the shofar affects the judgment. I mean, it's endless what's going on when the shofar is blown. And maybe you can get like a, the slightest little glimpse in your heart when you really focus on listening to the shofar and you feel some, some, some sort of cataclysmic shift all of a sudden, Teutonic plate shift as the shofar is blowing. But you know what? That's, th that, that's not even the point, is what I'm trying to say, because the blessing that we make is, we, th we say to Hashem, you know, blessed are you that you gave us this commandment, you may sanctify us with your commands, you gave us this commandment to hear the sound of the shofar. So even if you don't know any of these reasons, and we don't know the deepest secrets in the world, and we don't even know what's going on, and we're novices, and we're all in first grade, and we don't have a clue about anything, and we forgot why we blew the shofar, if you hear it, that's all that counts. That that's what's so beautiful here is that on Rosh Hashanah, get yourself a shofar, get yourself to a place where you hear the shofar, and it and it going into your soul on that day is what makes all the difference in the world. And it doesn't matter what you had in mind; you just have to hear it. You don't have to. In other words, what I'm saying is, there's no limit to the depth of our holy Torah, and so you know, there's no no limit to kavanot. And kavanot is very important. Lechaven, kavana, of course, means the direct intention, the because the root of the word is to how to direct it, how to aim. It's about aiming your prayer so that it hits the target. But the thing is that even if we don't know how to do that, Hashem is saying here in the blessing, you just need to hear it. Shofar and is guaranteed universal, guaranteed to touch every heart of everyone who listens, who hears it. Exactly. So tonight again, the 25th day of the month of Elul is the beginning of beginning creation. Of the beginning. And it's a special week, the last week of the year, for you to be very, very mindful and uh, just to be in the moment. Sometimes, unfortunately, we're not in the moment. And actually, that's what, that's what this teshuva of and waking up, mindfulness of Elul has been all about. It's certainly what Rosh Hashanah and the, and the days of repentance are all about being mindful again. Isn't there and, an um, understanding, Rabbi, that every, during these seven days, these seven final days, six days, that we, each day reflects that day throughout the entire year, upcoming year, and we can... I think, I think we're more accustomed to saying that teaching regarding uh, the 10 days of repentance, that uh, during every one of those days, it's like a microcosm that contains the day, uh, that day of the entire year. Let's say the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday of the of the days of repentance. But clearly, you're right. During this week as well, the last week of the year, we should be extremely circumspect, and we should be extremely, um, you know, focused on how we've spent the past year because mm -hmm. now is actually the re the renewal of creation. And then one of the beautiful things about this whole Rosh Hashanah deal is that we believe that Hashem is literally renewing uh, creation and renewing the covenants all over again and uh, you know as we are taught the books are open on Rosh Hashanah and it's awesome because the din the judgment for every person is written on Rosh Hashanah as it were let's say in pencil or the, in, the, in the language of our sages it's written on Rosh Hashanah but it's sealed on Yom Kippur now you could go crazy thinking about something like that. And here's a very, very beautiful microcosmic, right, microcosmic, <laughs> succinct sum, summer, summer toy, <laughs> summation of a Jewish mindset. Because you could think about that, you know, the fact that your, your verdict is being written on Rosh Hashanah, and you could lose your mind. You could be like, this is terrible. I, I'm, and you could be so oh, nervous. On, what's the use? You could be so nervous. But yet, you see, that's not the Jewish mindset at all because Rosh Hashanah is a holiday and you wear finery and, and we have beautiful meal to celebrate and we greet each other with the most beautiful, beautiful greeting at, uh, you know, at the close of the service on Rosh Hashanah. We turn to each other and we say, May you be written and sealed for a good year. And immediately it's a good, long life. And we're very, very upbeat but you know it's like this certain kind of of duo um, consciousness 
you know that 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 and, and there, there's a verse in Psalms that reflects this of gila gila birada, that we rejoice with trepidation, and you know it's 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 unlike any other experience in the world because yeah we have a, a judgment here and we're being judged, but our attitude is extremely extremely positive because we know that Hashem loves us and that He's giving us this opportunity to for total total renewal. And it's it's like it's like such an incredible birthday celebration. Like it's a it's the most beautiful birthday celebration in the world, and it's your birthday, on Rosh Hashanah. You know what else it is? It's the United Nations. <laughs> it's like the United Nations is the way it's really supposed to be, not not the monstrous uh, um, parody. Of, uh, from a Stephen King novel of the United Nations twinner, <laughs> the real United Nations of brotherhood and love is what is is exactly what Rosh Hashanah is aspiring to. And again, the prayers take take the holiday prayer book of Rosh Hashanah and look at the most incredible prayers in the world that are a, that are a dreamlike yearning and longing for universal peace and brotherhood. That's what we pray for on Rosh Hashanah as we coronate Hashem. And and um, that's what we're going to be praying for next week on uh, September 10th and 11th is Rosh Hashanah beginning Sunday night and will be observed Monday and Tuesday. What a way to celebrate life as the books are open and um, the judgment is passed over every individual, every nation. It's just so breathtaking to be part of it and to be mindful. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it also, as I do every year. God willing, be a great year up ahead for all of us. Tehei Shnat Ayin Tova. 5779 Tavshin Ayin Tet stands for, may it be a year of a good eye, meaning looking at everything with positivity and love and forgiveness Amen. and sweetness, looking Amen. at each other with um, just acceptance just like we want Hashem to accept us yeah well, if we want Hashem to accept us we have to accept others that's the way to do it got a good feeling about this year Yitzchak yeah I'm getting a good feeling I got a good feeling about the second half of Temple Talk oh, yeah. last Temple Talk at 5778 we'll be right back Temple Talk Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruvain here with Rabbi Chaim Richmond in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the 24th day of the month of Elul, 5778, 4th of September 2018. This coming Shabbat, the final Shabbat of the year 5778, is Parshat Nitzavim. You are all standing before Hashem. And uh, we've been talking about uh, Rosh Hashanah and the great significance of Rosh Hashanah, but last week, Rabbi, exactly last week, uh, on our uh, Temple Talk radio show, at this precise moment in the broadcast, we got this incredible message that uh, twins were born to one of our uh, red Angus c cows here, and... Uh, this uh, twins both were heifers, both are heifers. Females, in other words. And uh, one of them bears all the simanim, all the required uh, criteria to be an eligible candidate for red heifer. And uh, this we have now posted uh, online on YouTube and Facebook. A uh, short video, short but sweet video of this beautiful little red heifer uh, candidate. And. Um, what a beautiful way to uh, close out 5778 with this message of purity. Message of purity, a message of redemption, really. People get very excited whenever there's any sort of indication of uh, 
a red heifer birth because it is identified with the uh, messianic um, redemption because there is a, actually a quotation from Maimonides himself that the that on the and his comments on the on the Mishnah in Tractate Parah where it talks about the fact that throughout Jewish history from the time the commandment was originally given uh, until the close of the Second Temple era, there were nine red heifers altogether, which were sufficient to provide the red heifer solution, <laughs> purification solution for all those subsequent generations, but that the tenth red heifer would be accomplished by the Mashiach is actually what Maimonides writes. And therefore, speaking of an alarm, whenever there's a sighting or uh, any sort of progress, it's interpreted by many people as being a sure fire sign that we're on the right track. And so throughout the years, as our faithful listeners know, for actually for three decades, for me personally, I've been involved in attempting to uh, to raise red heifers, to locate them, to bring them to Israel, many different efforts and programs throughout the years. Um, most of them not so realistic because of the, the difficulty in, in getting uh, livestock here to Israel and under these circumstances and all of the different requirements and, and federal requirements and inter, international requirements that really can't be fulfilled. And obviously, the very best thing of all is, would be to have uh, kosher red heifer born here in the land of Israel, which would be... Um, the way the way to go, which would be the na the natural and organic, and uh, indigenous indigenous solution mm -hmm. to the to the problem. And uh, but again, we talked earlier about the Mashiach app, the Redemption app. You know what? Obviously, something's happening. A whole lot of shaking going on, as mm -hmm. Jerry Lee Lewis once said. <laughs> I had to get one Jerry Lee Lewis quote into our program. Why is that? For reasons Precisely. unknown. For reasons <laughs> unknown. But the point is, yeah, of course, uh, we're on the right track. Uh, and of course, this is a perfect time for the birth of this beautiful little heifer. And now that the heifer has been born under the auspices of the Temple Institute's Raise a Red Heifer in Israel program, uh, it will be under uh, supervision and will be uh, cared for uh, in a special way to ensure that uh, Protocol. Uh, it doesn't uh, get roughed up by it doesn't suffer any of the slender arrows of cows hefferhood that could normally occur in the, in the natural world. This heifer is going uh, to be posell it. What's the word for posell? Would render it invalid. Render this it invalid. This heifer is going to be in a in a in a um, first class upbringing. And I only go to the finest Spoiled schools. Spoiled little red heifer. Finest schools. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, in the meantime, behind the scenes, uh, tremendous research is, is being conducted as to the performance of the actual, actual preparations once the red heifer, if the red heifer should reach the proper age and still bears all the signs of Stay being tuned. a kosher red heifer. Stay tuned. We shall provide updates as they become available. Absolutely. So, if uh, purity of heart and purity of the of the sound of the shofar and the message of the shofar is one of the themes um, of Rosh Hashanah, that's also hearkened uh, in the red heifer. There's another theme of Rosh Hashanah that we've been talking about uh, ad nauseum, perhaps, and that is the universality, which is a very beautiful message, and that happen happens to be the opening messes and really the message all throughout this week's Parsha Nitzavim which starts at Atem Nitzavim Ayom Kulchem Lifnei Hashem Elokechem Rashechem Shivtechem Ziknechem Veshotrechem Kol Ish Yisrael Tapchem Neshechem Ogercha Asher Bekerev Machanecha Mechote Veitzecha Ad Shoev Memecha You're all standing before Hashem your God you, the, the, the heads of your tribes your elders your officers, every man in Israel, your youth, your young ones, your women, the, uh, the converts, uh, all that are in the midst of, your, of the encampment, from the uh, cutter of wood to the drawer of water. Meaning, I guess today, if you were gonna 
translate this in a modern uh, translation, you would add all sorts of, uh, of people. The idea is that it's everybody. Everybody's included in this list. Everybody is standing, and as the verse, next verse continues, I'm reading now, those verses were uh, verse 10, 9 and 10 in chapter 29 in Deuteronomy, and now verse uh, 11 goes on to say that you're all here to pass through the covenant with Hashem. Again, uh, as a new covenant being made here uh, uh, in the plains of Moab, I believe, uh, just before Israel's entering into the land, a re, sort of a reconfirmation, a renewal of the covenant with Hashem. And it even goes on to say in the, in the following verses that we're not re referring only to everybody who's standing here today, but even people who aren't here today, people who who have uh, future generations. Time has passed, the generations, penders who have passed and generations who will come. This is universality at its finest and most inclusive. And the, the idea that's being emphasized, I think, by these words that, you know, not with you alone do I seal this covenant and, and this imprecation, but with whoever is here standing with us today before Hashem our God and with whoever is not here with us today, that the covenant is binding on Israel forever. We're, we're in this thing, and, and it's for good, yeah, and we're it's in forever. This, we're in this forever, and uh, I also think it means that, uh, you know, jump on board. If you weren't here uh, at the last round, then uh, you're welcome to be part of, of the uh, community, part yeah. of the universal community now. The Holy Temple is a universal theme in itself. And we were talking about the red heifer, that prerequisite for the renewal of temple service. We were talking about progress that's being made in that area. And you know that um, we were talking about how tonight, the 25th of Elul, begins the process of creation. It's the anniversary of the first day of creation. Of course, the climax of creation is Rosh Hashanah, which is the birthday of Adam. And of course, we recall that Adam's creation was at the site of the Holy Temple because the the earth that that God used to form Adam comes from the place of the altar on the Temple Mount. And you can't get more universal than that. So in other words, I'm saying the theme of the Holy Temple itself really is embracing all of humanity. The sages teach us um, a very... Um, enigmatic expression that Adam was created from the place of his kapara, the place of his atonement. And that's a, refer a reference to the fact that uh, Jewish tradition teaches that Adam, the first man, he was actually created from the place that would become the place of the altar. And then, in fact, according to Midrash, when Adam was banished from the Garden of Eden and he made his peace with God, he brought an offering on an altar that he built on that very spot. Later that became the very place of the altar of Noah. It was also the place before that of the altar of Cain and Abel. It was the altar of the binding of Isaac. It was the altar in the time of the temple. So what does it mean, the sages, when they say that Adam was created from the place that brings him atonement? One can look at it in uh, a certain kind of mindset and think that it means that, oh, Again, there has to be this, this, this. Uh, there has to be this uh, replacement, you know. Like uh, Adam, a, a man sins, and therefore an animal has to be slaughtered in his place on the altar. That is not the Jewish mindset. That is not what the Torah is teaching us at all. That's not the idea when it, of the statement that Adam was created from the place of his atonement. The atonement, this, which, which means spiritual rectification, that's brought about when a person brings an offering to the altar, is the psychological process of uh, realignment that we've been, we've been talking about this so much lately in the past year and the teachings that we had at the Holy Temple uh, Conference at, in West Texas that are online and the whole concept we've been talking about. What the, sp and, the and, and of course we've been speaking about this a great deal during the whole cycle of the Torah reading of Leviticus of Ayikra. What happens when a person brings an offering in the Holy Temple on the altar? It's a very, uh, frontal, visceral, traumatic experience. It's a very powerful, moving experience, and it transforms a person psychologically because it makes one realize the sanctity of human life and what, and, and what life is really all about. 
It's a very, very deep topic. That's the idea of when a person brings an offering on the altar, it is a life-changing experience because maybe we've been behaving like animals, maybe we've been twisted in psychologically and we've gone into a dark place and we lost or tarnished the divine image in which man was created. And that's the idea of that, of that, you know, that, that place, the altar, atones for a person. Not because we're sacrificing an animal, I, you see, I use that word on purpose. Not because of that, but because of what goes through a person, because of the shifting of consciousness, because of the realignment, because of the, of the, of the flash of inspiration and, 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 and motivation for the, to change in the future that goes through a person when he brings an offering to the altar. And that's the idea that man was created from the very place that brings him atonement. Man was created, meaning from the very place that brings him back eventually to his proper uh, dosage of consciousness, of God consciousness, of what it means to be a person. Everything about the Holy Temple experience is so life-changing. And, and built and into man being, being intrinsically is the ability to do tshuva, the ability to, uh, to, to atone. Uh, it's a God-given, inalienable aspect of our being, uh, which enables our relationship with Hashem to flourish. I also feel, oh, you want to say something? Go ahead, Yitzchak. I also feel that in this parsha, there it sort of tips its hat to the fact that it's, it's the end of the year and on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, and there are some very beautiful, uh, what we call it, so it's a bits of advice uh, that Hashem seems to give uh, Israel at this uh, at this uh, moment uh, in time, and one is the idea, and I'm looking for it right now. Maybe you have it in front of you, Rabbi, where it says uh, uh, the the commandments aren't in heaven that you have to uh, uh, you know fly up for them or across the sea that you have to travel far to attain them. But they're they're right there in your You're heart. You're talking about chapter thirty. Talking about chapter, chapter thirty and verse eleven. Right For this now. commandment that I command you today, it is not hidden from you, and it is not distant. It is not in heaven for you to say, who can ascend to the heaven for us and take it for us so that we can listen to it and perform it? Nor is it across the sea for you to say, who can cross to the other side of the sea for us and take it for us so that we can listen to it and perform it? Rather, the matter is very near to you, in your mouth and in your heart, to perform it. That's interesting because, uh, to me, basically what they're saying is, listen to the shofar. It's like it's the same message. Like, you don't have to... You don't have to go to college, you know. You don't have to. You don't have to have any uh, high degrees uh, in order to get this. In order to receive God's blessing, you need to be able to listen, listen for the shofar, listen for that simple message. You know, the shofar is like the perfect viral video uh, content because. It doesn't take that long. It doesn't need subtitles. It doesn't. It's, yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. need to be translated. Right. Well, it needs close captions. Something, but uh, to me, this verse means there's no excuse because it's not like um, something that's elitist or something that needs to be to be explained or or something that's inaccessible. It's so close to us. It's so much a part of us. It's so it's so much wired into the mainframe. That there really is no excuse, and of course, you you left off the next verse yeah. after after these verses about how close the Torah is to us and how near it is, not across the sea and not in heaven. The very next verse, f chap verse fifteen of chapter thirty of this week's Torah portion: See, I have placed before you today mm -hmm. the life and the good, and the death and the evil. That which I command you today to love Hashem your God, to walk in His ways, to observe His commandments, His decrees, and His ordinances. Then you will live and you will multiply, and Hashem your God will bless you in the land to which you come to possess it. This is the whole the whole deal, and it's yeah. so perf perfect that this is always the last Shabbat of the year. And I hope everybody will be able to avail themselves of the Rosh Hashanah experience, even if you're home, even if you're not Jewish, even if you're not part of a community. Just knowing what's going on today, just knowing the potential that we have for uh, coming clean for purification, for starting all over again. Who wouldn't want an opportunity to do that? And just knowing that these books are open and that the, the din, the, the verdict is being written, and how that makes us feel. And it's, it's just such an amazing 
process to be able to reclaim our humanity, to reclaim our human identity, to reclaim the image in which we, was, we were created on this very day as Adam, uh, co as collectively and also as individuals, just as the, as the verdict is being passed on the collective human, human family and on every individual. You know, the, the um, special prayers on Rosh Hashanah, um, they have certain tunes traditionally. Of course, every congregation has their different traditions and different, you know, origins and many different, um, what's called nuscha'ot, which means versions. Um, and some of them, you know, of course, there's, there are Jews all over the world. There are Jews from Morocco and Iran and Iraq and Egypt and Tunisia. And there are Jews from Poland and Romania and Hungary and Russia. And they're not the same exactly in terms of the versions of how, how the prayers are uttered, but many of the tunes are very similar. And some of them are so old, some of them are a thousand years old or even older. And in fact, and, and the thing is that these tunes, you know what I'm talking about, it's like the, 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 the special mm -hmm. tunes that, of, the, of the prayers of the High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you know, these tunes, they're, they're very affecting. They're very powerful, they're very moving. They're not, um, I've been working on the railroad. Hmm. Or, uh, or um, she'll be coming around the mountain. These these tunes are I'm not, not that there's anything wrong with those tunes. That I'm just saying as a Jew, these tunes that are that are traditionally sung in the in the Beit Knesset in the synagogue, they're so soulful. They're so tremendously moving and they're so affecting. And you know that there's one part of the prayers at the end of uh, of the morning service and at the end of the musaf and actually in the land of israel it's every single day of the year if there if there are kohanim members of the of the priestly tribe present in the in the synagogue but in chutz la'aretz in the diaspora it's only on the on the festivals and the high holy days that there's the blessing of the priests mm -hmm. where they bless the people with an ironic blessing right and there, and there's a tune that's sung and there are variations in Nusra'od, again, versions of the tune all over the world. But there's one, there's one particular tune, which I think is like a root tune, and then there are many offshoots. And, and I remember this tune from 50 years ago when I was in yeshiva. And uh, it's, it's very, very haunting, beautiful melody of the Birkat Kohanim, the priestly blessing. I don't know if you're familiar with this, man. I can try to render it, but I'm not the most musical person, but it's like this, like... You know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. I was told on authority yeah. that that is from the Holy Temple. Wow. I was told on authority, in the name of the Chafetz Chaim, mm -hmm. that that is actually a, a remnant of the Holy Temple service, and that several other of the beautiful songs that are sung on Rosh Hashanah in the synagogue come from the Holy Temple tradition. Wow. That's very beautiful and awe-inspiring to take that in. One other... Uh, one other thing I'd like to cite from the Parsha Rabbi, uh, as we draw this show and the year to a conclusion, the, year, the Temple Talk year to a conclusion. And we will have a program, God willing, uh, next week if everything is okay. Before uh, before Yom Kippur. We will after Rosh Hashanah. It'll be a day late because Rosh Hashanah is Monday and Tuesday. But on Wednesday, the fast of Gedalia, we will have a program that day. And in case after all this we've said, and how you, how about how universal and how how open and, and welcoming and upbeat the, the uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah uh, prayers and, and, and message is. If you still have some trepidation, I think there's a one verse in this week's parasha that sort of God tips his hand. He, he lets us know if we, weren't, if we weren't sure till now who he's really rooting for. And that, Rabbi, maybe you'll, you'll read it in English. I think it's, uh, it's uh, chapter 30, uh, verse 19. I call heaven and earth today to bear witness against you. I have placed life and death before you, blessing and curse, 
And you shall choose life so that you will live, you and your offspring, to love Hashem your God, to listen to his voice, and to cleave to him. For he is your life and the length of your days, to dwell upon the land that Hashem swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. I mean, if you went to the racetrack and uh, someone gave you a tip, like which horse to bet on, you know, you'd put your money on that horse. Well, God is saying right here, choose life. He says, like, I'm giving you a choice here, but <laughs> take my advice. <laughs> it's choose life. Thought. And I think that's what, you, that's what Rosh Hashanah is all about, choosing life for the upcoming year. And uh, oh, I, I'd like to bless every one of us with, uh, with choosing life, that what we should all choose blessing. life and have we a good year. We want to bless all of, our listeners and the whole things. Am Yisrael and the whole world, every single human being created in Hashem's image. May you be signed and sealed for a beautiful new year. And immediately for good and long life. Amen. We're about to start, so thank you all for being with us today and Temple Talk for being with us this past year. And we're looking forward to it. It's a great next year, year, 5778, but best is yet to come. So thanks again, and Shana Tova from Temple Talk.